topic at hand, because a number of you are entrepreneurs with probably a grudge against the media because of its constant misinformation about battery electric vehicles and hybrids and all that, which is definitely true. And um, I blog in a bunch of places. I have a radio show. I've done a fair amount of TV. Um, I have a sense of how the media works. And I thought I could focus a little bit on using the media to your advantage and how to best approach the media. Because I'm someone who gets like 300 emails a day from people all pitching me to write about their product or their company or their car or their uh, accessory or their conversion company. I get that all the time. And in a split second, I decide I'm going to write about this or I'm not going to write about this. And a lot of it has to do with the quality of the thing I was sent. And uh, I think if people put more consideration into how they approach the media, they might get better results. And the media still has a lot of shortcomings. And I thought I would go through some of the different types of medium and how they talk about our industry and our product here. Because obviously the public at this point has a lot of misinformation about how electric cars work. That's why I think this uh, film is uh, very valuable. Because people, for instance, think that electric cars travel further than they actually do. Because they think they go 300 miles on a charge routinely. They think they're cheaper than they are, and uh, they think the charge times are a lot less than they are. That, that would probably be what the average person thinks. So there's inevitable sort of sticker shock when people actually see what they do and how much they cost. So that's kind of a gap that we have a, an issue with now. And you can say it's because the media hasn't done a good job in uh, talking about these vehicles and what they actually are. I would say is probably true. So if we stop, start with uh, TV coverage. I, I thought I'd mention the classic to me TV report about an alternative fuel vehicle was about compressed air cars. Now, <laughs> one of the calls I get most often as a reporter is, why are you bothering with these electric cars when you can run cars on air and uh, it would be like too cheap to meter or whatever? And uh, I happen to have written the definitive New York Times piece refuting the uh, compressed air car probably 10 years ago. But the company persists, this French company, yeah. uh, what's the name of it? Anyone know the name of it? It's amazing. It, it's like one of those whack-a-mole things. It mm -hmm. continues to rise again. <laughs> After it's de you know, every investor has gotten burned, but it still persists. But people think that you can run your car on air, go 300 miles, and we've solved problems. A similar one is running cars on water, by the way. So a typical TV report about the compressed air car is one of complete gullibility. So they see the car, they're given a ride in it, it runs, so then they believe every claim that the people say, that it'll run for 300 miles, they're opening factories in South Africa and California and Mexico, um, that there's going to be 100,000 of them made the next year. All the things they claim, and I've claimed over the years, they accept without asking any third party. It's all, in TV, it's all about the visual. But the visual of the car running, one car running looks like another car running for TV purposes. So the um, the oxygen car looks like an EV that's better than an EV, if you look at it on TV. But these are like NBC TV reports, or CBS, or you know, national media. And particularly in television, the way they cover things like that is with complete gullibility and no fact checking. And that drives me crazy. But when you think about how the media works, if the public is very interested in cars that run on air and water. That's the kind of report they're going to get. So uh, that's frustrating, but it's sort of the way TV works. It's all about the pictures. You have the car moving, and that's a good picture. You have the guy making a claim. And you have somebody who's invented like some water injection hmm. system for, that's going to change your mileage to 400 miles. It's going to make hydrogen in the car, and uh, your, your, all your problems will be solved. 
they do not investigate such claims, but it makes good TV, running a car on water. So um, you have to think of TV works that way. Your story has to be compelling. You know, your, your product either has to look nice when it's moving or make a loud noise or do something that uh, is compelling to the media. Radio, um, I think, is a real fount of disinformation. Speaking as somebody who does a radio show and has, fre has frequent guests from the auto world, um, if you look at the mainstream radio coverage of this, it's probably on talk shows like Sean Hannity or Rush Limbaugh. And their coverage of this is very much informed by a political agenda. Like uh, Rush and Sean and uh, some of those guys, their basic idea of the Volt, as an example, is that it's Obama's car. So anything you say negative about the Volt is, is fair game. So um, I've done several posts that are sort of truth squads about what has been said on talk radio about these cars. My basic idea, if you take the Volt fire issue, what people got out of the Volt fire thing was, no matter how many times it was painstakingly explained, and I'm sure a lot of you have done this, but what people got is Volt, fire, crash. Those three things. When a Volt's in a crash, it gets on fire. And um, Rush Limbaugh said about it, they all catch fire. I think that was his quote. They all catch fire. He said, and he, oh, he said they'd also sold 1,000 of them when they sold 8,000 of them. But, you know, that's, more people hear that than uh, most other sources of information on the Volt. So that's unfortunately an impression a lot of people have come away with. Now, um, in promoting this book, um, I used a radio-only strategy where I did 42 radio shows around the country. I had a radio promoter. And it was great to be able to talk to people on talk radio around the country. I didn't get on Rush, unfortunately, but <laughs> I did get Jay Leno interviewed me about it, which was nice. He did one of the best interviews about it. Um, so I got to talk to people directly about electric vehicles. And for a lot of people, I think I cleared up some misconceptions that I might have had. But uh, there is a lot of misinformation being spread on radio. Now, the blog area where Bill and I toil, I think is probably a pretty good source of information. Um, I wrote down a bunch of the sites. If you don't already know these sites, there's a bunch of them out there. There's, of course, EV World, which is probably the longest serving electric vehicle website, wouldn't it be? Yeah. Was it 94 or something? You well, 98. 98. So that's out there. That's been there as a consistent source. Uh, some other ones include, most of which I write for or have at one point or another, PluginCars.com, Green Car Reports, the New York Times Wheels blog, the Car Talk site, and they're very green. And Click and Clack are very green guys. Uh, Auto Blog Green, Edmunds Green Car Advisor. There's kind of a lot of stuff on the web. Some of it's very good. Like, for instance, there was a report earlier today that uh, Tesla battery packs turn into bricks. Any of you read that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, th th there was a, from some, un some website I've never heard of did this report. It basically said that if you let a Tesla battery pack deplete all the way down, it'll essentially seize up and never work again. And Tesla's been covering this up. And I've been following the way the media's been treating it. And a bunch of sites have responded to it. If I had time to write about it, I would have written about it pretty much the same way, pointing out that they didn't let Tesla respond, that a number of the cases they cite are rather dubious. Um, but, you know, it, it's possible that in some cases Tesla does have this problem. I don't think it was a worthless story. I just think it needed a truth squad. So maybe Tesla battery packs, particularly on the early roadsters, do have an issue. But uh, that story demanded to be more fully vetted. And online it probably was, probably not anywhere else, though. So I think the, I think the blogosphere, actually, even though it probably spreads a lot of misinformation. Like, if you were to go on 
Google and just type in Volt car fires, you would find a hundred stories that contain egregious errors of fact about what actually happened. But you'd also find some pretty good ones. You just need to know which uh, sources are reliable. So given that, I thought I would talk a little bit about how best to use the media and how to interact with the media as it is, because you're not going to change it yourself, but um, you need to approach, and, and I have ha had companies say General Electric, which you think would understand the media pretty well. This is a typical thing they did that you want to avoid. Uh, they sent out a press release saying they were buying 25,000 electric cars. Big story. Uh, the New York Times loved it. They wanted me to write about it. And uh, I ha all I had was the press release. Every press release has a contact on it, unless it's a bad press release. <laughs> but you need to have a contact on your press release so you can get more information. As a journalist, and other journalists are like me, I don't write stories from press releases. I need to actually talk to somebody. I need to know more than is on there. And every press release leaves you with 10 questions about how it's going to work. So um, being the New York Times, I get stuff early before the actual, uh, it's called an embargo date. Like if, if you have a press release and say you're going to send it out at 10 o'clock in the morning, the night before you can send it to select media and say, here's the release, but you can't write about it till we release the thing tomorrow morning. That's a good thing to do. Cultivate people in the press you trust and give them, the, um, give them the material ahead of time so they can start reporting on it. They don't get the story any earlier, but they publish a more informed story. So that's a whole lot better. Uh, so some media outlets did this. But what GE did in this case was they didn't have any spokesmen available. Now when you put out a major story like this, you've got to have someone available to actually talk to the press. In their case, they didn't. And this is one of the few times I've gone into to publication at the New York Times without being able to reach anybody from the company. And sometimes I've gotten responses like, well, you need to talk to Joe and he's on vacation. So I'm thinking, well, why did you put the press release out and put his name on it then? I don't understand that thinking. So if you're going to put a press release out, make sure you're ready to handle it. And a lot of uh, people, when they deal with the press, Think of it as the old magazine days when maybe your deadline is a month ahead. So they don't see any urgency at getting back to you. But much of the press now is dealing with deadlines that same day. So you can't delay in getting back to them. You can't think, I'm going to get back to that reporter tomorrow. Tomorrow is too late. When we're dealing with blog stories, I always start the story and publish it the same day. So there is, no, there is no lead time like that. Another really important thing is to have all your graphics ready. There's no point in sending out a story when you have no pictures to go with it. And people do that. Or they have pictures in absurdly low resolution that you couldn't possibly use. It happens all the time. And I'll explain to them, you know, that was like three pixels, that picture you sent me. <laughs> and that, that sends them to try to find the original, and it's on somebody's computer, and they're on vacation and all that. Yeah. But this, this happens all the time. You have to be prepared with all this stuff. It's great if you have photos, bios, backstories, B-roll video, all that kind of stuff. That's how the blogosphere works. That's how TV works. They want all that stuff instantly. Like TV will rapidly lose interest in a story if they can't pursue it immediately. Like if you don't have any video or you don't have something for them to photograph and you can't give it to them right away, they're on to the next thing.